If you like the video make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. For more videos like this. People, what are some of the true, creepiest urban legends from where you live? The Aboriginal people of Australia talk about the hairy men, which are some kind of ape-like beast. Another name is the Yowie. Basically, these things were blood-sucking creatures that would eat you, and the Aboriginal people were pretty afraid of them. Apparently, they would stalk you and follow you through the bush, and they move fast. The weird thing is that there are lots of different tribes in Australia with different languages, but all of the tribe names for these creatures translate to hairy men. Also, you've got to watch out for drop bears when you're in the bush. They fall on you from the trees and rip your throat out with their sharp little teeth. There is a local lake, and when I was growing up, I heard this story that a woman was drowned there by her fiancé. On certain nights, she would come up out of the water, and if you happened to be parked near the lake, she would put her hand on your windshield. If she pulled her hand away and it left a handprint, it meant you were going to die too. In Pennsylvania, there's the Seven Gates of Hell near Hellam Township. There was an insane asylum built in the forest, away from the general population, to keep all the patients away from people. It is believed that the asylum burned down, and many patients died during the fire or escaped into the surrounding forest. The name comes from the fact that a gate was built to keep the escaped patients from leaving the area. But when night falls, you can follow the path past the first gate and eventually pass through an additional six gates, and after passing through the seventh gate, you will end up in hell. That one is about the guy who got lost hiking in the woods, so he wandered until he found a log cabin. He knocked on the door, but nobody answered. The door wasn't locked, so he went in. There was nothing in the cabin but a room with a bed and lots of paintings of monsters and beasts' faces on the walls. It was very late in the night already, so he fell asleep. Nothing out of the ordinary happened. Then, when it was morning, he was getting his things ready to go out, and that's when he noticed the scary paintings disappeared, and in their place there were windows. We have this in my region, France. Basically, a bridge constructed in the 11th century was called the Devil's Bridge. Legend says that during construction, the devil would spend each night undoing the work done during the day. So of course they decided to have a deal with the devil, as you do in medieval France to build a bridge, he would let them build the bridge, but he would claim the first soul to cross the damn thing. They made a cat cross the bridge, the devil went mad, failed to destroy the bridge, and jumped off it into the water 60 feet below. To this day, the thing is said to be cursed since people sometimes use it for suicide. So the people say that the devil is still claiming souls, and to each their versions of how he chooses his victims. A popular one is that one of your distant ancestors was one of the bridge builders who tricked the devil. There is a creepy trail that a car can barely fit through that leads to a small hill with train tracks on top. If you can find it, you are supposed to put your car in neutral, and then your car will be pulled backwards off the tracks. The legend is that there were kids playing on these tracks who were killed, and they pulled your car off to save you. Some claim that if you put baby powder on your bumper, you will even see little hand prints on it after. One of my favorite legends from my home province is the tale of Slashfoot. There was a popular summer camp I used to go to that used to be a normal family ranch before it was a camp. In the 1960s, the family hired a man, Maurice, to be their ranch hand, and one day he ended up cutting his foot lengthwise with an axe while chopping wood. Since it was the 1960s and he was a hippie type, he refused to see a doctor and insisted on treating it with homemade poultices and shit. That's how he got his name. The family wanted to surprise him and bring his wife out for a visit one weekend, but she ended up dying in a crash on the way. He blamed them for her death and went legitimately insane from a combination of rage, drugs, and the infection in his foot. He made it his life's mission to get revenge on the family by tormenting them, leaving dead animals hung up by their door, killing their farm cats, and all that fun stuff. They never arrested him because of how guilty they felt for everything, they actually did feel at fault for his descent into madness. He was still alive for the first 10 ish years of the camp being operational, and since the camp was run by the same family, he took it upon himself to up the ante and torment the kids that came to the camp instead. I've heard dozens of terrifying Slashfoot stories from counselors who used to attend the camp as kids and had run ins with Maurice. There are too many to post here, though. I live in an old city, so there are other ways to enjoy urban legends and ghost stories, but this one's my favorite because of how mundane it is. There's this story that if you drive through the park at night, a police officer will pull you over for speeding. He writes you a ticket and tells you to be more careful when driving. When you go to pay the ticket, there's no record of one being issued, and the officer who supposedly gave you the ticket has been dead for years. The ghost cop doesn't kill you or curse you after giving you the speeding ticket. He doesn't even look scary like a ghost, 
Apparently. He just leaves. The ghost of officer mild inconvenience haunts my local park. I live in Maryland, and Goatman was a popular urban legend when I was a kid. Basically, a guy with the head of a goat ran around in the woods. Specifically near a bridge called the Cry Baby Bridge in Bowie, Maryland, I believe. I'm not sure if that's just a Maryland thing, but I recently saw it in the book Weird Maryland. Cry Baby Bridge was named that due to a woman dropping her baby off of the bridge because she couldn't take care of it. They say if you go on the bridge at night and are really quiet, you can hear a baby crying. The library in my hometown is attached to a 200-year-old mansion that was said to be haunted. Specifically, the attic, which is huge and shadowy and tends to collect dead pigeons, the local paper even did a story about the supposed haunting, with photo proof. The library did lock in nights in the summer, and they'd tell scary stories in the attic, which wasn't so bad because you were with a group. Later on, I ended up working at the library, and I would have to go up in the attic alone at night to make sure no one stayed behind after we closed. The attic had a gated stairway with a lock, and a few times when I was up there, alone in the house, I'd hear it bang shut. Hampton Roads, Virginia. There's a fairly famous bridge out in Yorktown on Crawford Road. You would expect the most famous story to be about hauntings at Ford Monroe or the ghosts of colonists at Jamestown, but no, you get some bridge that isn't even that old. Anyway, Crawford Bridge you hear all sorts of stories about car crashes. But the most popular story is that a woman hung herself on that bridge and still haunts it to this day. I went to a lot of abandoned areas in college, the most noteworthy being Glendale Hospital, Maryland, but I had never encountered anything quite like Crawford Bridge. I won't talk about an unsettling feeling or any of that. My car just flat out died. It wasn't even a lemon or anything, a 2007 Nissan Murano. After ducking around with it for about two minutes, I was able to get the power on. Then the radio started up, on its own, and began changing stations and volume, on its own. It was probably some sort of interference, but it makes for a good ghost story, I guess. Most people in the US have heard of the Mothman. Most people don't know that the legend was started after a Native American chief named Cornstalk supposedly cursed the land. I learned all of this after researching my family history. It turns out that one of my ancestors, Ichabod Ashcraft, lost his brother after he was killed by Chief Cornstalk's tribe. Ichabod joined the army and later took part in Cornstalk's murder and assassination, and he and everyone else who took part were acquitted after the other soldiers refused to testify against them. The legend states that Cornstalk cursed the land before he died, and the Mothman was part of this curse. I was told this was a true story about a town in Wisconsin. This town has mostly corn fields and is flat, sort of a drive-by town. There are some pretty deep woods off the highway that shelter a church. The church actually dates from the late 1800s and has been long abandoned. At some point, teenagers and some creepy old men took to performing satanic rituals at the church. They made attempts to call creatures from hell or inter demon demons. After this goes on for some time, they find everyone dead at the church after they've been missing for a couple days. Completely shredded and mutilated at the site. The general consensus is that they succeeded in their efforts but were unable to control what they had called. Now this jumps to a first-hand account from a social studies teacher I had in junior high. She claimed that this was well known in the town. When you drive through the town area around this church, do not stop your car. Whatever was called is still there, hunting at night. So a social studies teacher's friend is driving through this area to visit a friend in the next town. He's blasting through this road, surrounded by corn fields, and minding his own business. Suddenly, there was a terrible shrieking and ripping sound at the passenger side of the car, and the car thumps hard. Thinking that something just blew, he carefully slows down and gets out to take stock. The scene is as follows, the moon is out, and it's quiet in the middle of the country. The corn stands quietly in the dark with the headlights blazing in front of the car, illuminating the green of the fields. The engine is ticking from the heat. No wind, but some small noise from the field as the corn plants touch each other. Walking around to the side closest to the field, he observes that the passenger side has what appears to be claw marks that puncture the metal running from behind the front door all the way to the back bumper. The bumper is metal, and it has been pulled back like something was hanging from it. Spooked and now knowing the car is still operable, the guy runs back and gets in, taking off quickly. Not too long after, the man arrives at his friend's house. He brings his friend over to the car immediately and conveys the story to the friend. The man hearing all this turns sheet white. He then informs the friend of the story above about the church. He tells him that this happens to people from time to time. When people get out of their cars, they usually disappear. My dad told me this when I was a kid. Basically, Duck Mexico. 
When my grandpa was still living in Mexico, he used to go out and hunt animals and sell them to the local vendors. One day, when he was gutting one, he found this weird looking stone. He kept it because it looked like nothing he had ever seen. After he found it, he would have a bunch of luck with hunting, but my grandma warned him to toss it somewhere because it was cursed. One day he was sitting on top of a tree with his rifle, and it seemed like his luck ran out because he had nothing all day. So he sat there waiting, and then he started hearing what sounded like chanting. He looked in that direction and saw torches and other things coming towards him. He stood up and saw ducking leprechauns. Scary as shit. They basically looked like demons, but like humans. My grandpa jumped out of the tree, threw the rock, and ran the duck away from there. He ran back all the way home, which I think was over 15 miles. He said he had never been so scared in his life. He ran all that as fast as he could. He never told my dad what they exactly looked like or any other details. My dad said he never liked to talk about it. Growing up in the mountains of eastern Kentucky, there was a legend about an adulterous woman who was murdered by her husband in the early 1900s. The story said that the husband planned a picnic for their anniversary, where they wore their wedding clothes and reaffirmed their vows. During the picnic, he confronted her about the affair and nailed her to a tree using railroad spikes. The legend said that if you were in the woods near the site, she would follow you until you crossed a stream, then she would just stand there sobbing, unable to follow any longer. I spent a lot of time in those woods with friends, and of course our imaginations ran wild. Well, when I was about 20, my grandpa was involved in relocating a cemetery in the area. He said it was boring work, except for the time they moved a corpse in a fancy dress that had a hole right through her forehead. One of the stories of the Jersey Devil. Napoleon Bonaparte's brother, this part is historical fact, was living in New Jersey for a time. He was a fan of hunting, so he went out one winter day hunting bears. The bears in New Jersey are a different sort than in France, so he was excited. This part begins the legend. He got separated from his bodyguards while he was following hoof prints. They looked like they were running because they were close together, ankle to ankle, but long in stride. He figured it was a deer running from something, possibly a bear. His suspicions were confirmed by claw marks high on a tree. The prints passed, but there were no bear paw prints in the snow, and it was fresh snow, so there should have been. Anyway, he tracks the deer for a while, and it goes under logs too low for a deer, skips terrain and all, and seems too slow. He finds no spore but broken branches, disturbed leaves, and broken ice high up and in passes too narrow for a deer's antlers. So he's thinking this is some odd New Jersey creature. Well, he was right. Because abruptly, the track stopped in a copse of pine. Couldn't be found anywhere. He's creeped out and decides it's time to turn back, so he turns around and is confronted by a tall, two-legged satyr-type beast with bat's wings, deer legs, a man's body but leathery, and a donkey head, and its arms had claws for hands. The story is that it screeched, and he unloaded both barrels at it and was found pissing himself off by his bodyguards. Did he really see JD or just say it to avoid embarrassment? I prefer the first option, myself. My uncle told me this when I was a child, and it kept me awake many nights. He said he was driving home for work after dark when he spotted a young girl walking on the side of the road, stopped, and picked her up because it was very cold outside and she was only in pajamas. He gave her his coat to keep her warm and drove her home. She got out of his car and ran into the house. He went home. He realized she still had his coat when he got home, so he figured he'd just stop at the house on the way to work the next day and retrieve it. He got there, knocking on the door. Mom answers the door but informs him that her daughter died on that road several years ago, and if he gave her anything, it could be retrieved at her grave, as this was a fairly regular occurrence. He got directions and found his coat on her tombstone. Thanks, Uncle Tim, for scaring the shit out of me when I was just a kid. While at primary school in my little village in North Somerset, UK, the local vicar told us about the dancing girl, who could be seen at midnight dancing on the grave of her lover at his church. She was the daughter of a well-to-do family, and he was of a lower class and died mysteriously, probably murdered by the rich family. She then killed herself by hanging from a tree in the churchyard over his grave. Anyone who saw her dancing would die swiftly soon after, which the vicar said he had. I think he told us around Halloween, but it could have been the last talk he ever gave us, memory fuzzy. No one ever saw him again, and the assumption was that the legend had gotten to him. If he knew he was leaving his position, that is one hell of a way to go out. But what if? I never believed in werewolves or anything like that until one night when some friends and I were cruising around the back roads of our town, which is located in a hilly area along the Mississippi River. There wasn't a whole lot to do where we lived, 
So driving around was a common pastime of ours. I was sitting in the backslash trunk area of my friend's Jeep, looking out the back window, when I noticed something along the side of the road. It looked like a muscular shaggy dog, but stood at least three to four feet tall on all fours, had muscular looking legs that almost resembled human biceps, and I could see the reflection of its eyes staring at the vehicle as we drove past. Where it gets weird is when I mention it to my group of friends. We all became stricken with horror when we realized three of us had seen the same thing along the same road on different nights but never brought it up because coyotes were common in the area. I still don't know what to think, but what I saw was too large to be a coyote and too shaggy to have been a cougar. To this day, I wonder if some unknown creature lives in those hills. In the small town I grew up in, we had the black lady's grave. The story was something like a black lady's baby was killed by someone or some people. Probably race related. So she would go to the grave and dig up the baby, sit on a tree stump with a candle, and rock it to sleep or whatever. The grave is in a local forest. Every time I've been out there, the baby's grave is covered in baby gifts. You are supposed to leave a gift if you visit. Also, there is a tree stump, and it always has candle wax on it. I would leave whatever was in my pockets, like spare change or whatever, just to play along. Very creepy at night. It's just cool how every single time I go, there is a pile of baby toys. I'm sure if I went today, there would still be about a year ago, I saw a published book called Indiana Horror Stories, and this story was in it. The creepiest part is just the weird ghost hunters that are out there sometimes. It's called Step Cemetery, and all the graves date from around the 1910s. The Fae. I grew up in rural Ireland and saw a few things that, even now, I can't explain. I saw a light moving quickly across a field, it was probably about 10 to 15 feet off the ground. Disappeared into the trees too low to be an aeroplane or a helicopter, too high to be a tractor, too late as well. People are like, shit, you saw a UFO. Bitch, please, that mother ducker was a will-o'-wisp or something. Then there's the fairy ring. It feels like someone is standing right beside you when you walk near one, the creepiest damn feeling I've ever had. I was camping one night in my backyard, 1.25 acres of land, with my buddy, who was only about 7 to 8 at the time. Buddy wakes me up and says he heard some singing. I'm thinking it's just my mom singing along to music, but I can't hear anything. We open up the tent and look outside, there are no lights on at the house. Then we hear it again, like this otherworldly, bittersweet voice, it was like silk but also raspy. It was like there were two voices rolled into one. It was then that we saw her. Absolutely gorgeous, the hair was like gold spun into individual, infinitely thin strands. The skin was like cream eyes like the most intensely bright emerald her face is carved into my memory. She slash it was so beautiful yet terrifying, my buddy wanted to go and meet her and follow her. I couldn't do it, I was frozen to the spot. It was almost like every cell in my body knew that nothing good would come of it. I managed to hold buddy back, then she walked into the trees at the edge of our land and disappeared. I used to hear the singing every now and again as I grew up. It terrified and captivated me every time I heard it. My town is super haunted. The big three are Charmin, the Billywhack Monster, and Scary Dairy. On Old Creek Road, late on a misty night, as you cross the bridge, a man will appear and attack you. Sometimes he's on fire, but most of the time he looks like a burned victim with nothing but charred flesh remaining. The Billywhack Monster is a leftover experiment done by scientists back in the 1940s. They were trying to create a super solider and goofed up. Whatever they made escaped and haunted the local hills and farmland, scarring campers and mutilating livestock. Supposedly, he has the head of a goat and bleats like one, but he walks around on two legs and is seven feet tall. Finally, Scary Dairy is an old, haunted dairy farm that may or may not have been used as a cover-up for a secret underground science facility where they conducted less than ethical experiments. I live and have lived for most of my life in the small town of Mechanicsville, Virginia, about 10 miles north of the lovely city of Richmond. Mechanicsville used to be a rural town, but it's expanding rapidly. When I was growing up, the nearby super malls and chic shopping centers were all farmland. Studley Road is a curving country road that runs east from State Route 301, winding its way past the few small schools in the area, diving in and out of the cool, shady woods on summer days, with small houses and fields when the woods gave way. In one of those small houses by one of those fields, a little girl lived, raised by her mother and father, an only child. Like all small towns, Mechanicsville has its share of delinquent residents, and her father was one of them. Essentially, the town is drunk. Legend has it that one night he got drunk, ended up with his family, and then took his own life with a gun. Unknown to him, the little girl ended up surviving for a bit. 
Unable to use the phone and with no neighbors nearby, she made her way down Old Studley Road. She never found her way and apparently died by the side of that old road that fateful night. Legend has it that in one of those shady, cool turns into the woods, on certain nights, you can see the little girl walking slowly down the road to her neighbors or the hospital nearby to get the help she needs. It is said that she always appears to be facing away from the spectators. The fateful few who have pulled over to help her supposedly report that, upon shouting, they get no response. Approaching closer leads to her suddenly turning around and letting out a blood-curdling scream and gurgle from her broken face. Other versions say that when seen from the front, she seems to be covering her mouth in a coy, girlish laugh, only when closer do you notice the blood down her front, where she releases her jaw and, of course, screams and gurgles at you through it. The legend is called the Studley Girl and has terrified me on late-night trips to or from my friends' houses throughout my teenage years and beyond. On Long Island, there's a town called Ronkonkoma, which has a really big lake in it. It used to be a really cool place to hang out and swim, but now it's way too dirty. Anyway, this is the story of the Lady of the Lake. Supposedly, Ronkonkoma was the name of an Indian princess who fell in love with a white settler who lived near the lake. Upon their meeting, the princess and the settler immediately fell in love, but their union was forbidden by her father. Every night, they would sneak out to send messages of love to one another. Ronkonkoma would paddle her canoe out to the middle of the lake, where she would then float a message the rest of the way to her lover waiting on the opposite shore. This continued for years, until one day the princess was unable to deal with this arrangement and snapped. She sent a final farewell note to her lover. He received it on the shore, and minutes later, the canoe washed up in front of him as well. Inside it was the princess's body, she had committed suicide in the middle of the lake. He, too, committed suicide out of anguish over the death of his one true love. Since that day, Ronkonkoma has haunted the lake, becoming known to many as the Lady of the Lake. Angered because she wasn't allowed to love in life, she now drags one man into the lake each year. People say that at least one person has drowned each year in Lake Ronkonkoma for the past 200 years, the large majority of the male. Many others have reported being drawn by some unseen force out to the center of the lake, as if something was trying to drag them in. These souls have been able to resist the pull of the Lady of the Lake and have been lucky enough to live to report the existence of this strange phenomenon. We have two out where I live. The first is on this road called Pine Run Road. Basically, you can see shadows moving across the road. I saw them myself, and it basically looked like a shadow of a person in a walking motion that moves from one side of the woods on the side of the road to the other. When I saw it and the lights from my car hit it, it was like watching someone disappear into the tree itself, not around it, just straight in. Gave me goosebumps. The second story is about a ghost woman known to us as the Suskin Screamer, based on a back mountain road called Suskin Road. I admit I do not have the balls to do it, but the story is something like a woman was murdered here on her wedding day, and you can see her. The thing is, though, that in order to see her, you have to stop your car in the middle of the night or early morning, turn your car off, take your keys, and put them on the roof of your car. Then, when you look into your rear view mirror, you'll see her sitting in the back seat. There was a legend in my hometown that there was a crazy homeless guy who lived in the woods behind the high school. They called him Ellen Redadra del Rio, the river creeper, because they thought he lived in the river, and there was a big Hispanic population in my hometown. They said he was nearly 8 feet tall and had superhuman strength, he grew hair all over his body, like an ape. They said he wore patches of ivy over himself, becoming part of the forest, that he grew his fingernails to razor sharp claws, and that he could strip the skin off of a squirrel with a single swipe. They said he would bite the jugular veins of small animals and suck the blood right out of them, unless he could get his hands on human flesh. Girls who went jogging late in the day would say that he jumped out and tried to grab them. I found a camp once, and I thought for sure it was his. A bunch of branches leaned up against a tree to make a hut down on the river bank. Once, in senior year, a bunch of friends and I got drunk and decided we were going to hunt him down. We gathered up a bunch of nets, pitchforks, and baseball bats and spent all night stumbling around the forest chasing shadows. It was pretty awesome. The Stanley Hotel is in Estes Park, Colorado. This is the hotel where Stephen King had a nightmare and wrote The Shinning. It has had a lot of deaths, I can't remember how many in total, but it's scary shit. You walk into the hotel and just feel this feeling of death and despair. People in the hotel tell you all different kinds of stories about it. People hear the piano constantly playing, parties going on in the ballroom, but it's actually empty, etc. My favorite story is when, while filming Dumb and Dumber, Jim Carrey stayed in the same room as Stephen King did years before. In the middle of the night, Carrie came running down to the front desk, 
saying he wanted to check out ASAP. He said there was something in his room standing over him and whatnot. The experience I had with the hotel that was creepy was that I heard footsteps behind me and yet no one was there, and then I heard giggling and lights flickering. They give really great ghost tours at the hotel. Also, they keep all the mattresses people died in their sleep in this other building. Creepy. There used to be an old bridge out in the woods, known to the locals as Tilly Willy Bridge. It had no guard rails, was eroded, and was barely wide enough for one car. I'm talking about maybe two feet of clearance on either side of your car. Rumor has it that back in the 50s, there was a young woman driving across it with her young child and baby. The baby started making a fuss, and the young woman turned in her seat to see what the problem was. In the process, she accidentally drove off the bridge, and all three of them drowned. It is said that late at night, you can see the young woman in her white dress twirling in the woods nearby. Others have seen a ghost car crossing the bridge. The Tilly Willy rite of passage is to drive out onto the middle of the bridge, turn off your car, and wait. Your windows will fog up, and you'll see baby handprints. Some claim to have heard the woman crying out for her baby as well. Having grown up here, I've been to Tilly Willy many times late at night, and I can say with certainty that it's creepy as duck, haunted or not. It's completely isolated, and you access it by dirt roads. Unfortunately, it's also super hazardous for cars, so it was torn down recently to make room for a modern bridge. In the dungeons of Warsaw lived Basilisek. It was a huge monster with wings like a bat, a tail like a crocodile, huge claws, and eyes that could turn people into stone with one look. Every midnight, he came out of the dungeons to eat people. During this time, the earth was shaking from his heavy feet, and wind was blowing from his enormous wings. The mayor said that he would give a lot of money to the person who killed the creature. Many had failed and turned into stone. One day, 15-year-old Mark, a poor boy from the city, told his little sister, Magda, that he would defeat Basilisek. The next day, she found her brother's statue. On her way back home, Magda was crying when she saw a mirror selling shop. A little voice in her head told her to buy a mirror and reflect the stone-making look of Basilisek. Magda ran into the dungeons, praying for the mirror not to fall down. Basilisek looked into the mirror and turned into a statue, and everybody that was made from stone was turned back into a human. Magda and Mark were happy together and got a lot of money from the mayor. People were happy that the danger was gone, and many of them sold parts of Basilisek. All that is left of the monster today is his crocodile tail, which you can still see in the dungeons, as a tourist attraction. The Bell Witch John Bell was a farmer who lived on a modest two-story homestead in Adams, Tennessee, with his wife and children. One afternoon, walking the perimeter of his land with a varmint rifle, he spotted a creature in his cornfield, some hellish chimeric beast with the body of a dog, the head of a rabbit, and the face of a man. He fired several times, but it evaded him and escaped into the woods. From that point on, the Bells knew no peace. Their dinners would be halted by incessant battering on the walls of their home. John and his eldest son would leave to investigate and find nothing. The children complained of nightmares, sounds on the floorboards, and then at the foot of their beds. Then their covers would disappear in the night and be found in the fields outside or stuffed into cupboards or closets too high for them to reach. Soon, the whispers began. The voice of a woman calls out the family by name. Beckoning them to the cave, just behind the wood line of the forested corner of the Bell Estate, none dared go. Who would sing to the Bell children ghastly atonal renditions of hymns, mock and threaten the life of John, and single out his daughter, Betsy Bell, for the most virulent of first verbal, then physical torment. Betsy would awaken with fingernail-like scratches on her body, as if she'd been clawed at in the night. Over time, the whispers grew into accusatory shouts. Then, screams. As the events continued, John Bell's physical health declined. The color drained from his face and hair, he took ill for months at a time, never fully recovering. He would complain of a weight on his chest and labored breathing, and always the whispering voice of the witch was with him. It lasted for three years. In his final days, he was bedridden, gripped by an unquenchable fever. Surrounded by his grieving family, he passed painfully from this world. And no sooner than his dying breath had left him, the room erupted with the cold, sourceless laughter of the bell witch, who, after that day, was never heard again. It wasn't a specific urban legend about my hometown so much as a general urban legend. The legend is derived from late medieval legends where people journeyed through a forest and found a forgotten village the forest grew up around. The only surviving building is a stone church where the last of the villagers gathered before the Black Plague wiped them out 100 years earlier. The travelers find their skeletons still seated around the altar. In the case of my town, we're surrounded by steep, 
high hills. Hikers found a car that ran off the road with a woman's skeleton in the driver's seat. She was reported missing in the 1970s, but with her car gone and no internet or cell phones, authorities concluded she simply drove away. Which she kind of did, but she ran off the road, crashed in the deep underbrush, and nobody found her until years later. There are similar stories in other places, but mostly about cars that crashed into ponds and came out looking like what a car submerged for 20 plus years looks like. Her car and her personal effects were mostly intact, basically, a 1970s time capsule. I was driving down a West Virginia back road in the middle of the night when I came around a curve and saw an injured dog standing in the middle of the road. I slammed on my brakes and missed him by a hair. I got out to find him because he was limping really badly, and I was hoping he'd have a collar. He vanished into thin air. Six months later, I was going down the YouTube rabbit hole and watching a video about the most haunted places in West Virginia, and they talked about this road that is haunted by the ghost of a limping dog that lures people into the night. Ducking. Road. They said the route name, and I almost threw my laptop across the room. I'm not superstitious. But now? I'm a little stitious. There is a person in Modesto, California, calling herself the Modesto Witch. She is somewhat of an urban legend in Northern California, and there are many individuals who follow her as disciples. From what I gather, her story goes like this, she has lived for hundreds of years, but she was originally a Native American medicine woman, banished from her tribe for the crime of becoming a skinwalker. She survived on her own for decades and was responsible for the many disappearances that occurred in and around Modesto, California, around the turn of the 19th century. At some point, she came across a coven of satanic witches during their black mass deep in the forests of Stanislaus, approached them in her animal form, and was welcomed into the coven by the other witches. It was with this group that she entered into a pact with Satan and eventually formed the devil-worshipping cult, the Church of the Fallen Angels. Having knowledge of both Native American magic and satanic black magic, she sought to find a way to live forever and found a way to suspend herself in time while living within mirrors. Over time, the legends of the Modesto Witch and the Church of the Fallen Angels became widespread in Northern California and other parts of the country, where the cult is said to have spread, now having members in the thousands. The members of the cult are all said to have sold their souls in exchange for different dark gifts, such as astral projection, the ability to possess other people's bodies, and forms of transformation. They are responsible for hundreds of missing women, all used as human sacrifices at their gatherings. Still, at the heart of the cult is always the Modesto Witch, who is the most deprived and evil of them all. It is said that she possesses what is called a baptismal touch, with which she is capable of transforming human beings into snails, which become her playthings until eventually satisfying her appetite. To this day, her victims have numbered in the hundreds or more, but none suffer more than those who are unfortunate enough to experience her baptism. I heard all of these things from real people I've met who belong to this cult and worship Satan and the Modesto Witch. Believe it or not, I've even encountered the Modesto Witch twice. Once it was behind a closed door, and the other time it was with my back to a mirror. Both times, I was alone. Not me personally, but my dad's family are huge believers in fairies and little people, as strange as it might sound. They're from very, very rural Ireland, my grandmother still lives there, and honestly, when you're out there, it feels like it could be real. My grandparents both swear to the existence of fairies and claim to have seen them. My dad, who's a pretty reasonable guy, had an experience when he was younger and walking through a field after dark with his brother. They noticed a little man sitting on a tree stump and realized that he was too small to be human. They started walking towards him, but when they got close, he just vanished into thin air. The story of the wolf girl of Del Rio. In the 1800s, a cowboy and his little lady settled down on the Rio Grande, near Del Rio, where he rustled up cattle for a living. His woman grew great with a child after some years and went into labor one night when her man was away on a cattle drive up to Fort Worth. A storm was raging outside, and while inside their cabin, she went into labor by herself. Lightning streaked the sky, and despite what Llewellyn Moss claimed, there are lobos along the river, and the night she gave birth, they were howling. When the man came back, he found his wife dead from childbirth, but the baby was missing. The door had been opened when he showed up, and in the blood on the ground were paw prints. Many years later, the now old cowboy was sitting on a ridge as the sun went down, looking over his herd. As he looked into the sunset and reflected on what his life may have been had his girl and child lived, he noticed the cattle scattering. He looked down and saw wolves prowling on the edge of the herd, and with them. A long-haired, human-like form, running on all fours with the pack, growling like an animal. And that's when the screaming began. 
I must have been 12 years old during the time I visited Colombia in 2004 with my older brother in the summer, visiting some family. We were really free in the fact that we would go outside and play with the neighborhood kids and come back in the evening to eat dinner. In this neighborhood, there was a river behind these apartments, and there was always the saying that it was haunted by La Llorona, which is a Hispanic urban legend about this woman who drowned her kids and would cry in agony at night, mourning for her kids in regret. Now this story is not about that, not at all, maybe something even more terrifying, and I'm glad I wasn't the one to see it with my own two eyes. Anyway, it was broad daylight, and my friend Santiago, my brother, and I went to walk around the river. Being the kids we were at the time, it was fair to see that we were slightly spooked about that urban legend, but it was okay since it wasn't the dead of night. After about five minutes of just minding our own business and throwing rocks at the nearby trees by the river, some shit went down. I just remembered turning around and seeing the face of my friend Santiago in utter shock. Both my brother and friend screamed, what the hell is that? Do you see that? I was too scared to turn to see what the hell was going on because the next thing I knew, Santiago and my brother were ahead of me, and I did not want to be left behind. After getting to the street and escaping God knows what, I quickly asked them what happened. The two looked at each other and asked if they saw this demonic creature hanging on the tree, smiling at them. They both confirmed the same description, and luckily for me, my eyes didn't lay on it. I can't believe they saw the freaking devil, I thought, but then I realized that they must be trying to scare me. I went with the flow, as they were still scared about what they just saw. I believe in what they described because, now that I'm 26 and my brother is 30, I would ask him every blue moon if what I experienced wasn't a damn joke. At first, he was pretty hesitant to even confirm or deny what the hell he saw, but as time passed, he realized that it was the real deal. I grew up in a very small rural area in southeast Missouri. There are two that come to mind. First is the tale of the Whitaker woman. The story goes that there was an old man and woman who lived in a small shack in the woods. The only way to and from their house to the main road was a 10-mile walk down a worn trail. The old man was a hoarder and kept every penny he ever made in jars and buried them somewhere on his property. The old man passed away unexpectedly, leaving the old woman all alone, as they had no children, and without passing on the location of his stored money. Soon, the bank came and told her they were going to foreclose on her land and home. In what is said to be the coldest winter scene in the area, she decided to go looking for her deceased husband's buried jars of savings. Having never ventured too far from the house without her husband to help guide the way, she soon became lost in the hills and hollows of the Ozarks. Weeks later, a bank representative came to give her final notice and found her corpse frozen to a tree a short distance from the house. Legend says that on cold winter nights, usually the first snowstorm of the season, you can hear Lady Whitaker walking through the hollows of her property, asking her husband to help her find a way home. My house actually sat in Whitaker Hollow, and my mom used to scare the hell out of me with this story. The next is the story of an old man who built a small town called Leeper that he named after himself, which is no longer a town but more of a community. The guy was super wealthy and looked at all the town folk as country bumpkins. He would ride around town on a jet black horse and basically make fun of people for being poor. One night, he talked down to a stranger at the hotel in town and was shot dead in the street. No one really liked him, so they buried him in an unmarked grave in the woods. Legend goes that whenever the train runs through town at night, old man Leeper can be seen riding his horse next to the old hotel, looking for the stranger who murdered him. My grandmother lived in Leeper and, much like my mother, would tell me and my cousins this story to keep us from wandering away from the house after night, she was about one quarter mile from the hotel. These are my two favorites, mostly because they are not mass-produced urban legends but more local myths and lore of a small, forgotten town. When I was a kid living in Texas, I had a recurring dream. In this dream, I was walking down the street of my hometown, and a man would walk towards me. Sometimes he was older, and sometimes he was younger. He didn't always have the same face, but I always knew it was the same man. He would get closer and closer, and I would know that something bad was going to happen, but I would wake up each time before he reached me. I would be terrified. One night, in my dream, we finally got face to face, and I spoke to him. I said, what is your name? He said, my name is Sammy. And then I woke up, and I was so afraid that I couldn't go back to sleep. I went to my sister's room and said, can I get in bed with you? I've just had a really bad dream. My sister said, was it Sammy? I said, what did you say? How do you know Sammy? And my sister said, I don't. But you just brought him into the room with you. I turned on the lights, and I saw that my sister was asleep. So here's my story. When I was 14 years old or so, I used to experience some creepy as heck stuff at my sister's two-story house, 
she never believed me and accused me of making it up to try and scare her family. So I used to sleep over all the time, but slowly things started happening. I kept waking up at 2, 3, and 4 am I always had trouble falling asleep, they would all go to sleep at 9 pm I wasn't used to that since my mom would let me sleep whenever I wanted. Well, it started off with me just having sleep problems, but then I started noticing a dark spot in the hallway that was darker than everything else around it. And each night I'd stay over it. It started to get darker and darker and more detailed until I finally realized it looked like a man standing in the hallway looking into the room. I was in, or so I thought. I couldn't make out the face, all I knew was that he was wearing a hat, and he would just stare into the room. Obviously, I'd be freaked out and would force myself to sleep. One time I remember going to the swap meet with my sister's family when some lady went up to me, grabbed my hand, and told me, you see stuff, don't you? I was puzzled, and my sister intervened and said, can I help you? She then turned to my sister and told her, she sees things that are trying to get her attention, don't let her interact with them, they're dangerous. They know she can see them, they want to cause harm to her, so be very careful. She turned to me and said, don't talk to them, don't give them your attention. She walked away. She was a completely random woman, but I remember the day so clearly. It was during this time that the paranormal stuff was happening at the house, and then everything that was happening became too much. I didn't want to sleep over, but my nephews insisted I did because they wanted to spend time with me, so I decided on the worst. Last night, to change rooms, I slept in the next room with my niece, who was around 8 or something years old. I thought things would be different, but, oh, was I wrong? That night I had no trouble falling asleep, but this time something changed. Instead of me waking up on my own, my niece woke me at 3 a.m. to take her to the bathroom, so I did. We went back to bed, and as I was lying there having trouble sleeping, I heard a little girl giggling. I turned to look at my niece and asked, what's so funny? She was fast asleep at the same moment a kitchen toy set that no longer worked or had batteries went off, and the toy sound of bubbling hot water went off right after the giggles. I turned to look at the hallway and realized the shadow wearing a hat had been looking into that room the whole time, not the other one I was in to begin with when I freaked out and something started pounding on the wall right next to my ear. I pulled the covers over my head, panicking, thinking, holy moly, I don't want to get dragged downstairs. Then everything went quite well, and all of a sudden I heard something whisper my niece's name into my ear. Well, I'd key, this was happening, but after that night, I decided never to sleep over my sister's house again. Skip years ahead, and now a few months ago, I'm watching a video online of urban legends, paying half attention. As I'm crafting something when I hear the words this legend is about the hat man, and it instantly got my full attention afterwards. I looked up scary stories about the hat man. And everything everyone said was almost exactly how stuff happened to me. I never knew the legend of the hat man, but apparently I experienced it, and hearing how some people had worse experiences and even physical ones, I feel very lucky. I had never heard of the black-eyed children until I encountered them. My girlfriend and I live in a small gated community in southern West Virginia called Glade Springs. The community has about 150 houses, a country club, and a steakhouse slash bar called Bunkers. Now anyone can come through the gate during the business hours of Bunkers, but after they close, the front security gate stops all traffic and makes sure you are a resident, and if you're a visitor, they call the house that you're going to to verify that you are actually expecting them. Sometimes it's a hassle, but hey, you don't have to worry about a robbery. So imagine my surprise when my doorbell chimed at 3 a.m. I was jarred awake and wasn't sure if it wasn't just a dream, considering I had just gone to bed shortly before and was probably just going into REM sleep. I rolled over and looked at the clock, noticing the time, and when my doorbell chimed again, I felt a cold chill run through my body. Not reading too much into it, it could be that one of my neighbors has an emergency, right? I nonchalantly made my way to the door, now I see how foolish I really was, and opened it. Luckily, the wrought iron storm door was still locked because who or what stood before me was not a resident of the community. Two young boys stood at my doorstep, one looking about 17 and another looking about 10, wearing dark hooded sweatshirts and jeans. The young one had shaggy, dirty blonde hair and would only look down at the stone steps, and the older one had his hood pulled and his head tipped to where I could only see from half his nose down. My voice caught in my throat, and before I could even ask what they wanted, the older one spoke. His voice sounded forced and dry, there was no emotion or sincerity in what he said, I'm sorry to bother you and your girlfriend, but we need to come in and use your phone, we've been in an accident. I felt the familiar chill return to my whole body. How did he know my girlfriend was here? I wrote it off as my Tahoe and her VW were in the driveway, and I figured they just assumed, I tripped over my words, 
something about these kids wasn't right, wasn't normal, wasn't human. Uh, um, I can bring you my cell phone and you can call, I don't get service inside here, so you have to stand on the sidewalk to call. I finally said it nervously. Of course I was lying through my clenched teeth, I did not want these kids in my house. Well, my brother really needs to use your bathroom, Kane, we have to come in, the older one said. And that's when I went into complete panic, he knew my name. I'm sorry, are you from here? How did you know my name? The words practically shook out of my mouth. That's when he became slightly hostile and demanded to be let inside, and I told them I was sorry, but I couldn't help them, and just as I was about to close the main door, it happened. The both of them snapped their heads upward and looked me straight in the eyes. Black. No iris, no pupil, no retina, just pure, deep black. I was paralyzed with fear. For a second, I thought those kids were just playing a really cruel joke, had snuck into the community somehow, and had bought some of those freaky supernatural demons clearer contacts. That was until I heard ringing, it was like a ringing sound that you hear when you have a hearing test done, that digital high-pitched shrill ringing, and then the flashback started. I was suddenly a toddler again at my grandparents' house, sitting under the chestnut tree with my mother picking up the nuts and putting them in a large metal soup kettle. It was a crisp fall day. It's one of my earliest and dearest memories, I was about three and even have a picture, and one I hold very close to my heart. But then they were there, behind my mother. We locked eyes, their eyes were still black as night, and suddenly they smiled simultaneously. That's when everything went black. The next thing I knew, I was shaken awake and lying on the mud room floor, my girlfriend standing over me with a worried look. What the hell, Kane? She asked. I had no idea how to answer her, my head had taken a good whack against the slate floor, and a bit of dried blood was stuck in my hair, but other than that, I was fine physically. I slowly remembered everything that had happened and looked at the door in the daylight. I've never been so happy to see the morning in all my life. I told my girlfriend everything that had happened, and I honestly think she thought I had brain damage from hitting the floor, but she insisted she believed me. And then we searched online, and I believe that's when she really started to believe me. I don't know who or what they are or where they come from, but they're not of this world. I know that for a fact. For some reason, I had a lingering thought, I'm still not sure if they put the thought in my head or not, that they wanted me to know that even my memories aren't safe. They are very strong and seem to be growing in number. For some reason, they seem to not be able to hurt you physically unless you invite them in, which I don't know since either no one has ever let them in or the ones that have aren't around to tell their story anymore. I have a few stories and experiences that have all happened where I live. I live in Wales in a small village called Glynneth, which is situated in the heart of a valley. Right next door to Glynneth is a place known as Cumgrac. In Welsh, this translates to the Valley of the Witches. Back when I was a kid, there was this old manor house known as Abergwyn Manor. It was owned by the Williams family, who also owned the colliery about a mile away from the manor house. The colliery is still there and active. I don't believe the colliery is still owned by the last descendant of the Williams, but I know he sold the old manor and the surrounding land to a friend of mine's mother, who converted it to a farm with her boyfriend. This was back when I was about 15 or 16. It was named the White Lady Farm after the urban legend about a bride who stood up to the groom and ran away with her sister. Heartbroken, she supposedly hanged herself and was rumored to have haunted the old manor and the surrounding area. I heard this story when I was a young boy, but I never thought much of it. When they had just gotten the farm up and running, I remember we brought the story up and were laughing and joking about it when all the pigs behind the wooden fence, bunched up together and looking in our direction, began squealing like crazy. It was spooky, but it got weirder. I remember staying there one school night, not long after that instance, and it being completely in the back of my head. It was just me and my friend in a small caravan playing Operation Genesis, Jurassic Park, and we were expecting another friend of ours to join the party. He lived about a five-minute walk from the farm. There was a knock on the door, and we opened it, thinking it was him. But there was no one there. Note, the area is surrounded by gravel. Anyone who would be walking around, we would hear them. We called him to check where he was, and he stated he had just left the house. Five minutes later, we hear the same knock, and again, we open the door to our friend walking down the path, roughly 50 meters away from us. It did not make sense, and it never happened again during the night. A few weeks later, I stayed there again. Sometimes during the night, the gasoline generator cuts out. It's me, my friend, and his younger brother. My mate handed me his torch and told me to shine it on the generator so he could see what he was doing when this completely black figure ran past me from my right, and my head panned with it as I watched it disappear into the darkness. To my right there is a fence where the pigs reside, and it's about 4 feet in height, and there is a gravel path to my left. 
whatever that was would have had to make a noise to jump over the fence, and it would have had to make a noise when running on the gravel, which it did not. It looked like it was an actual person dressed up in a black hoodie and tracksuit pants or bottoms, and it had weird looking legs. As if it were wearing football socks that went over the bottoms or pants or those old style aristocratic socks, but all in black. It was a very strange experience. It's not like the horror films, though, because in a horror film, it's expected that something is going to happen. I could never have predicted that. After that happened, you were left with, okay, that just happened. When I was around 13, my mom, older brother, and I moved into a three-story new build house, it was on a new built housing estate and only about five years old. I had two friends over in the middle of the day watching films, and we decided to play a game. Me and one friend were standing on the top floor of the house in the bathroom, which was directly at the top of the stairs, and my other friend was standing at the bottom of the stairs. We were laughing and joking when suddenly, what looked like a black sheet covered the bathroom door and then seemed to disappear into my mom's bedroom. Me and my friend in the bathroom both looked at each other in disbelief, and my friend at the bottom of the stairs saw it too, she was standing on the stairs in disbelief too. I used to help my mom a lot with the housework, she was a single parent and worked a lot. I thought I would hoover up the stairs before she got home, it must have been around 5 pm. As I was hoovering the stairs, I saw a black figure at the bottom of the stairs looking at me. When I stood up straight to turn around, he, always thought of him as he, ran into the wall and seemed to fade into the wall that connected to the garage. Nearly every night I would wake up at random times to use the toilet, and he would be there. I just stood in my bedroom. The thing is, though, that he never scared me. I didn't feel frightened or uneasy when he was around. I felt like he may have been looking out for me, but you never know. Me and my friends gave him the name Simon, a name that popped into my head after seeing him a couple of times. Other little things would happen, like things moving around the house when I swore I put them somewhere else. Or I would hear someone on the stairs when no one was in or feel like someone was in the room with me. But yeah, like I said, I never found him to be scary or make me feel uncomfortable. When I told my mom about it all, she told me to not be silly and stop watching horror films, but I overheard her talking to my stepdad, saying she thought something was in the house. I got talking to someone in the village I lived in, and he said the housing estate was built on what was believed to be a Roman burial ground. It was right on the river, and I know that back in the day, it was the quickest way to get from village to village. Maybe a lot of bodies got dumped there when being carried back to their village, as that used to happen a lot back then. 